So now I'm calling the first um, speaker, or the, the first specialist, we would say, Andrew. So, um, my first impression is actually both sides are saying the same thing. I was actually expecting to have like left to center or center left arguments on one side and extreme right arguments on the other side, but actually we're actually saying the same, the same thing because just as the um, government said, define all refugees on 51 million displaced people on earth. Of course, that's not going to be the case. So it is, I suppose, it's a matter of where you put your capacity, I don't know. Uh, what certainly is the fact is that not all uh, asylum seekers are coming to Europe. But the interesting thing of the crisis, I think, why is it called a crisis? Basically because it's revealing, well, I think, systemic um, failures that we have been maintaining and sustaining for decades now. And now all of a sudden, we cannot hide that anymore because, well, they are much uh, bigger numbers. Um, so, for example, I, I don't think that the Schengen Aki is being um, lost because within the Schengen um, regulation there is a clause that permits <coughs> to temporarily um, do some border controls. I don't know the exact um, technicalities of it. I should look it up. Um, what, what does uh, this crisis um, show, on the other hand, is that the Dublin regulation <coughs> doesn't work. Because the Dublin regulation, which is the one that applies in, uh, for asylum cases, what does it say? It sets um, a hierarchy, if you wish, of uh, criteria to follow when you're processing uh, an asylum claim. The, least, the, the lowest um, criterion is, well, the first country of entry, which is usually external borders. But an external border can also be an airport, so it might be Brussels or Frankfurt. It's not a physical external border. But then, of course, there's other criteria in the Dublin Convention, such as are there other family members in other uh, EU member states, or humanitarian reasons for processing the asylum claim in this country, rather than sending the person back to um, the other country. So if there is one piece of European legislation which is being undermined here is the Dublin Convention. And for proponents of open borders, that's a good thing, of course. Um, but of course, the Dublin Convention was already, had already been problematic for quite some time. I don't know if some of you followed the case of um, this uh, <coughs> Afghan asylum seeker who eventually <coughs> went to court against Belgium and Greece uh, before the European Court of Human Rights and, and won because Belgium should have known not to send this person back to Greece because in Greece not only would he have been um, submitted um, to inhuman treatment because, well, the reception centers, how they call them, are in the poorest state and he had to sleep outside in the park and was also sent back to Afghanistan, made it back to Greece, and so on. So that was the first real blow to um, the Dublin Convention. Anyway, this for um, this piece of legislation. On the duty to accept, now, there is duty, it, 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 it's kind of a, of a moral term, isn't it? So we're, we're speaking here in moral terms. And one thing is, people are here already. So can you really talk about a duty? They're here, so now you have to do something about it. Now, one thing that is sure, and you were referring to the treaty on the functioning of the EU. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I don't, I don't what article was it? 78.3. And do you know exactly what it says? Uh, kind of. Wait, I will put okay. the microphone here. So, emerging situation where the Euro European Commission proposes and the Council, after consulting the EP, uh, wait, okay. States confronted with an emergency situation, centralized but uh, 
characterized by a sudden inflow of nationals of third countries into one or more member states. So they, they should have a, a proposal there. All right, I was thinking of totally something else actually, no, but no, that's okay, that's very no, interesting as well. specific about that, uh, um, I mean, members of the European Union should find a solution in, if there's a sudden inflow of nationals of third countries yes. in the European space. Yes, that's so that for European that's interesting. That's that's a valid argument. I was thinking uh, more technically. There is the um, Refugee Convention, the Geneva Convention of 1951, and its protocols uh, of 69. I think I can't remember exactly the the years. Anyway, it, it doesn't oblige states to treat uh, the uh, asylum seekers uh, for. I mean. How shall I put it? put it differently? As all international treaties, there's also a, always a lot of debate and not all countries want to accept certain things. So there was this clause written in the Geneva Convention of 51, which is the no refoulement clause, which means if there's someone knocking at your door, to put it in those metaphorical terms, you cannot just send the person back. That would be refoulement, and you can't send someone back before you have actually treated um, his or her claim. Mm -hmm. So okay. what Hungary is doing, for example, or, or any border, when you shut your border so that people cannot come in, that's actually technically refoulement. And you, that's not allowed. That's an infric an, an, a violation of international law. Because you don't know whether that person might need assistance. And if that person needs assistance, you have the duty, because you ratified the convention, it's part of your, um, of your law, so you have to at least register their claim. Yes. And if I may, I, I think I read an article about that who said that. So it's what is called Schengen Information System, where basically you have a full database that all the member states, European Union member states, have access to, and where you see all the people who register to, to who are seeking asylum. And once one, uh, a person, a refugee, is rejected, he, he doesn't have the possibility to apply again. So it's rejected from the European space totally. So the situation, I guess this is one of the reasons why people they don't want to register or go through uh, Hungarian because by default they, they are not <coughs> accepted and they wouldn't have the chance to be accepted again, I guess, in other member states. There was a question here. Is it related to the same? I, I guess it's a puntualization. I don't know if that's easy. Form? Okay, uh, it's okay. It's, it's, uh, the, the reason is rather the opposite. So if you got registered in Hungary, then you have to stay there. So and then, Another one, yeah. And, and if people know that there is no, no uh, adequate uh, assistance, so they prefer to go somewhere else, mm -hmm. where they can make up a life. Right. Um, just a, a small thing. It's, well, you have the Schengen Information System, and the one for the asylum seekers is actually not the Schengen Information System, it's the Eurodac system. But they are, of course, interconnected. Yeah. Now, the thing is, when, technically speaking, when you cross a border, you're registered. Technically, that already happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, theoretically. Practically, it's not always easy to do so, and maybe certain, you know, immigration officers, under the pressure of the amount of people, or under, you know, governmental pressure, they decide not to do so because once you're registered, if you follow the Dublin Convention in practice, governments always send you back to that first country. It's in the past 20, 25 years, maybe, security and immigration have been coupled. It wasn't the case 40 years ago. Um, legally speaking, historically speaking, we say the, the frontiers, the borders were closed in 1974, following the oil crisis and so on. Uh, the end, the, de the decline of the welfare state, uh, the growth, well, not the growth, but the country, and um, the shrinking of the economy in, in, Western, in, in Western Europe. So all of a sudden we could not um, accept uh, migrant labor, which we had been recruiting for about three decades before, if not longer. And exactly the same discourse, uh, I mean, uh, this, this red card actually confused me. My apologies. Um, but for, let's say, 30, 40 years, we accepted people coming to work here, and there wasn't this security discourse. And now all of a sudden, because we've decided that 
our economy cannot sustain migrant labor, we're talking about security problems. Now, I don't have the time to go into details of this, but it's, it's very interesting to see how we have securitized an issue that actually has nothing to do with that, because the rest is actually intelligence work, police work, which is linked to individuals and not necessarily to migration. That means I have? Zero. Zero? Uh, well, I, had, I had finished this point, I had other points, but never mind them. Um, I'm pretty sure Giacomo will have similar okay. points. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. As was said before from Andrew, of course, and, and now we are meant to, to uh, bring in maybe some empirics. Uh, into the discussion, I guess that's also the, the role of academics, right? And especially when the topic is it's so hot, so let's say, or so sensitive for people, or so politicized. And I guess here, here uh, it's interesting to to um, a bit maybe shuffle the figure as, as it has been given so far. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking, um, so what I'm going to tell you now comes from, uh, I'm working on uh, border management from uh, 2008. I've been uh, living in Lampedusa, Fuerteventura, Malta, Melilla. Uh, so very topical, uh, very, very, very uh, central uh, places, let's say, in, in what is uh, the migration management. And, uh, and uh, of course, then what has to do with the refugee and refugee crisis. And, and here, um, I guess, uh, in terms of taking in some empirics, I would start to, uh, of course, uh, I'm going to put it like a question I'm going to answer them, then of course. <laughs> but uh, who do you think they, they are these refugees? So how do refugees uh, be, behave if any pattern there is on, on how people um, you know, deal with, the, with very, very, very difficult situations? So uh, reality means data, means empirics, numbers, uh, says that uh, most people as us, as uh, uh, if you want to make a divide, uh, it's very pleased to stay quite close to their to their family, uh, to their friends, maybe to their places so, um, of origin. So um, data confirms, and the Lebanon case, the Jordanian case, uh, uh, goes in line with this, that uh, people prefer, especially when they have to escape a war, uh, to stay quite close so when the conflict finish, people go back. Uh, that's a very basic. Of course, maybe after three years, the situation worsens and worsens. Well, maybe someone decide, okay, let's go, let's try, let's go in another place. Why? Because uh, uh, let's go back to the case of, uh, of Syria. Uh, condition in the camps um, in Jordan are not so positive, uh, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, the numbers are huge. Uh, before, I mean, uh, the, the, the picture was given, uh, I brought some number myself, I guess that there is no more need. So the, 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 the relevance of the numbers of refugees that Europe takes in, it's, it's absolutely and nothing compared to the rest of the world, okay? And we are, of course, one of the most affluent societies. So if that is a cost, I don't see how other countries can cope with that, and Europe cannot. Um, said that, um, you, you think, who are those people who finally decide to, to take and walk from Turkey to Europe? I mean, can you imagine what? Or to take a boat, risking your life. And how do you, they do that? They do that with the big money because it's expensive. So imagine as a profile, more or less, most of the time, those people who uh, decide to uh, undertake such a trip uh, and are, are quite uh, um, well-off people in their country of origin. So uh, we have uh, upper middle class uh, coming. So that's why mm -hmm. uh, you see this educated person. And that's why uh, apparently then um, uh, we accept them better than others. As if you don't study, you deserve to die probably in your place. I don't, I don't clearly understand this divide. Um, so, uh, so that's to say that this will eventually decrease the social cost because these are already educated people that will certainly contribute to the uh, well-being of our societies if that's how we decide to select people uh, on the basis of uh, this principle. And, and then, and then uh, once this picture is given, I guess it is also interesting to, to go back to the border, maybe it's more of my expertise, and giving you more figure that um, uh, provides you a, a picture. Um, first, um, those people crossing the border without documents represents, constitute, and of course, we are, we are 
We are speaking of estimation because uh, it's undocumented border crossing, it's undocumented uh, residency in Europe, so uh, you, only, you only size that, uh, but not perfectly, right? So uh, those people crossing the border illegally that are those who we really see, because are those who land, who arrive in Lampedusa, are those who cross the net in Melilla, are those who are crossing the borders now, well, they are less than the 10%, 10 to 15, let's say, Frontex data, of those who reside illegally in the EU. Illegally means without the necessary documents, okay? So, uh, when I heard we should open the border, we should close the border, just to let you know, the 90% of people are overstayers, so people who enter with a visa and then the visa expires and they remain in the country. And uh, these are the well of people who can, uh, who can have a visa to enter the EU and then there are the almost well enough people who start taking such dangerous trip because generally, again, the poor people, so the idea of this, uh, um, of this inflow, as it was said before, of these liquid terms, right? This wave eventually, you know, as it said, of poor people in need of help, it's fake, just to let you know. It's, it's not necessarily the case because poor people in, in country of origin tend to go uh, where they can, they can afford to go. That will be maybe in the cities if they are in the countryside and so on. Okay, so now, Provided this picture that I guess uh, gives a little bit more of a reality in, I was going, maybe, uh, yes, I pointed out the security issue. Okay, um, we always overlap, right? This, uh, we, now maybe the media, the politics overlap these terrorism security things. Okay, let's again go back. So the, 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 the um, terrorist attack that took place in Europe or the US, was not done by people who crossed the border illegally. So there is no empiric relation between undocumented border crossing and terrorist acts. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how do we decide to do politics then. Do we do politics just for feelings or because we feel maybe those are dangerous? Or do we base ourselves on empirics again, on data? If we do the second, if we opt for the second, well then there is no point in making the relation between security and border control or uh, allowing people to come, everyone, some, doesn't really matter in security terms, okay? Um, and this relates to a further element that maybe is the last I'm gonna put into the discussion, uh, that has to do with the, actually the really mechanics of the border. Uh, we say this is the biggest crisis, and it probably is. So that now I don't have the exact number since the, the Second World War, and I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay, again, undocumented border crossing Ill is an illegal activity. is not detected. So data that we have are those that we detect. The point is, I worked a lot in Lampedusa, and to give you an example, before going to Lampedusa, I was in Sicily speaking to other academics experts, and they told me, well, you shouldn't even go to Lampedusa. Just stay in Sicily, travel the southern coast of Sicily, and you will see tens, hundreds of Lampedusas. Why? Because border crossing through the sea, as through land, is simply impossible to detect fully and completely. Take the sea. Uh, you have <laughs> okay, that is a too long story to tell, so let's put it like this. You take a fishing vessel, and I w I've been working with fishermen especially, and you meet another fishing vessel on another boat in international water. You take people in, that's it, it's done, you, you come back. And you have 5,000 euros per person. You have a sailing boat, you decide to, to you are in, in Tunis, and you need uh, 50,000 euros, voila, you have the game, it's done. Three person on board, and you take the people in. And, 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 and I'm... And I'm uh, telling you this after, uh, in fact, eight years working on the topic and seeing how it works. I had the even border guards telling me this. Even a British border guard telling me, okay, what we do with in, the, in the English channel is just to, 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 to kind of display control. But control is not actually implemented. Mm. But not because uh, they don't care. It's just because it is impossible. So uh, there is no way to detect uh, if, okay, there is a website, it's called Marine Traffic, you can go, you see uh, the traffic that happens in a certain area of the sea at any given time. Try to go, I suggest you, and put it uh, in between uh, southern and Sicily or in between France and, uh, and England. So it's, uh, you, you will see just hundreds of little points. 
each point is a boat. Would you think there is any way to go and check every boat? No, right? Beside, of course, moving through water or through land, uh, I mean, water is even more, uh, it's time demanding. So you have one boat here and one 100 kilometers uh, there. So how can you go? It's eight hours uh, navigation, right? So just again, in terms of bringing in the reality, I don't really think it is any security issue. I don't really think it is any issue of closing or opening a border, because if you want, it's already open, but it's also already closed for a lot of other people. And to my point of view, uh, given the, yeah, I'm almost finished, given the, the international agreement signed by most European states, we should just take uh, charge of what we sign. And regarding the Gulf country, of course, one of the requirements is that a refugee needs to go in a safe country. Safe country means that he or she will know that uh, fundamental rights are respected. That's not the case of country that are not signed certain convention. Gulf countries are among them. So, and, uh, so I said, OK, and it's not a security issue. It's not a border closer or open. And it's not, I guess, about burden or number, because in any case, if that was a cost, we are speaking of what, the 10% of the overall. So let's put aside the cost benefit and just go with the principle, maybe, to take care of people uh, in harm or fleeing destruction and war is not, it, it's a little bit more humane than just making calculation of any sort. Okay, yeah. Thank you. That's it. Okay. So now, um, if you can join uh, your colleague, and now we can take questions. And also, if you have questions to debaters as well. If you have a microphone, there is a question here. Can I ask a question to the other side? Of course, after, yes, of course, yes. So, so I, the first, the audience. I have a question for the two academics. Okay. So I think the crucial point is how we define a, a, ref, a refugee or a, that is seeking asylum. So it's really important and how, it's not so clear with the people that are arriving to Europe whether, like, maybe they have, some of them may have been living in Turkey for many, for a few years and suddenly they, they decide to come to Europe. I'm not against personally about uh, against welcoming them, but I think it is a fair point to ask, are they really seeking, uh, I mean, f escaping war at that point, or are they really uh, economical immigrants, which then a different procedure should apply? <laughs> um, again, I, I don't have uh, studies on the field for the Syrian case, so I'd, I'd, I would go, with, of course, a bit of bias. Well, there is always bias, even if you have done studies on the field, but in any case, for what I understood, it's uh, a little bit about people who have other relatives or friends or part of the community in Europe, and of course, they might have been, but that's again, can be, I can be completely wrong on that, so uh, uh, it might be people who have resisted inside, let's say, Damascus, until the situation was so bad that then you, you flee. And it might be people who have been three years in Turkey resisting in maybe not exactly a situation, a convenient situation in terms of fundamental rights, thinking, well, maybe in one year, two years it finishes and we can go back and rebuild our village country relations. This didn't happen, so they decided, okay, let's, let's move on. That uh, might be one of uh, the... So after that, of course, then there is a a matter of defining uh, what is a refugee or an economic migrant, but in a way you can also turn upside down the, the situation and say wh why an economic migrant if you are escaping um, death of hunger is not a refugee. So, you know, th there is war, there is climate uh, uh, refugee, there is plenty of uh, different situations, but that's of course up to the state, I guess, to uh, the convention to, yeah, sorry. <coughs> Yeah, I think it's important to remember that even if they choose to continue their journey from Turkey to Europe, it's still very, very dangerous. And they are aware of the danger of the trip to Europe. So if they still feel like they should take the risk and risk their life to come to Europe, that they still feel threatened in, in these camps that are in Turkey. And if they are willing to take the risks to come to Europe, 
I think they should still be considered like uh, as refugees because they're still running away from death and war. Okay. Another question? Yes? Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I have a question for the opposition. Uh, well, in the light of what has been said uh, by the first speaker, he made a great difference be between migrants and refugees. And uh, I would like to know in your take, is that really relevant uh, to talk about sustainability, as you as you've mentioned it many times, when you are talking about refugees, because refugees are people who are staying here a few, few times, maybe a few years, and then coming back in the country. So I'd like to know if it's really relevant to talk about sustainability. It's a comment mostly um, about like why we were talking about consequences because the crisis is basically a consequence of the conflict in the Middle East, and uh, the Western world uh, is talking about like how we're going to mitigate this uh, refugee crisis, but we're not talking about like what we can do in Middle East to make peace over there, um, and. Um, Another, well, that's a question of mine. Um, so um, the conflict in Syria and Libya basically started because of Arab Spring in 2011. So why this crisis is happening right now, like why Europe is experiencing the um, refugee influx right now? Do you want to, one of you, one of the... Uh the migrants from Syria are Syrian. The migrants from Libya are mostly like, for example, sub-Saharan Africa or Asian that were there working. So I would distinguish between the situation. And, and then personally, though, I guess the case, but I have no data with Syria, is more of the length of the crisis. So after a certain point, people just decided, okay, let's move on. But I can be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if I can just add something, uh, in those countries that have had the, the Arab Spring, they are characterized by the end of a demographic, demographic transition, which means that the proportion of young people of our generation and above, so it means from 18 to 24 or 30 years, is higher, really higher. So it means also that they are um, they have jobless, and, um, so they're really uh, higher jobless. And also, these people are more qualified, they are more skilled, they are more tech savvy than their parents. So it's a bit the same question if you ask why was in 68 those protests of the young people in Europe and USA. So it's, we can explain this with, with this information. Okay, so uh, I would like to, to add one point from what I read in some articles and support uh, Giacomo. Yeah, your point of view about the length of the of the, the crisis in, and the war in Syria, and it's not only you know, the opposition fighting the government, you also have ISIS, you also have the rebels, so it's like it's war everywhere. First and second, um, I think there are also a lot of refugees that uh, are coming from uh, Turkey and from neighboring countries that they don't have, they no longer have the capacity to to, to host all of them. And there, there are too many refugees that, over time, they went to, of course, neighboring countries, but they now they those countries they no longer have the capacity, and that's why I think they are coming to to Europe more and more. Just to add to that, mm -hmm. yeah. maybe it's also the management of border by countries such as Hungary. That made the, the story. Sorry, maybe it's also the management of the border that made the, the things more visible. Yeah. Because again, uh, it was uh, I guess last year uh, about 200,000 passages from the Balkan routes, but you just didn't have any visibility from media and politics. Now it's just a double, but it seems like a phenomenon that never happened. Yeah. In uh, you know refugees coming in and saving them. And then about uh, integration and assimilation in our societies, and the uh, conflicts, and and these things are treated separately. But uh, I think sometimes what we don't hear enough is that first it's connected. Uh, the flow of refugees won't stop unless the uh, uh, Syria is solved, for example. And uh, the second is. Uh, real uh, incapacity, what it seems to me, of European societies being able to integrate uh, people coming in. And it's not just about refugees, because uh, if it would be only about refugees, uh, it would be much, uh, m much more manageable, but it's also about uh, huge flows of migrants from sub-Saharan Africa who, um, 
who are escaping, of course, uh, horrible conditions. But the European societies are not able to integrate these people. We are creating these areas uh, uh, which basically perpetuate the misery uh, here and uh, they're outside the system. And I think uh, it has to really, uh, we has, uh, the Europe has to look much more into, uh, deeper into the well, integration or assimilation or so. Nowadays, um, immigration has really become a political stake. And talking about it, and I think what in Belgium the NVI is doing right now is just showing tough language for you know to get some votes there you know to to please their electorate. But then I think from right to left over the decades, political parties have basically done, maybe not said, but done the same thing. Now integration sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think where you invest more, where there's more you know, more of a welfareist approach to integration. There's higher success rates. But I think in the long run, it's, it, will, it will have to be that, you know, you live together and you, you learn to get along. Um, I mean, this is not science. This is, I think, my opinion. Um, very often in these discourses, is about it's not sustainable to have all these immigrants or these refugees. Now, when you come to think of it, what are the arguments that are put forward? Um, refugees or immigrants, they come and you know they're on our welfare they're on our unemployment and we cannot support that but if you can, if you look no that's not what you said but it's part of the discourse of anti-immigration and maybe that's part of the whole why doesn't integration work or why should we open or close our borders i just wanted to add that but um just just one rhetorical thing if you come to think of it in the past 40 years our social systems, have they been in cri put in crisis because of immigration, because of unemployed, or is it because of austerity politics that have been introduced ever since the 80s, basically, and now even more? There, there was a, a question I'm asking you all. Giacomo, do you have a uh, final word? Uh, okay. I don't know, I, I guess it's a very politicized topic, much more. So the, the empiric has really, or the data, or the reality has, has really like put, been put aside. And um, that's of course, I would say, I would agree with Andrew, that um, politically speaking is very convenient for people who have to implement unpopular policies to say that the guilty of everything wrong that happens to you is because one person you can clearly identify, maybe because of the skin, is the problem, but maybe the the, the relation is, bo is, is the, the issue is more among the poor and rich rather than uh, than uh, um, the place from where you come from. So uh, you have this very difficult district where you see you have insecurity, right? The urban security because it's uh, you, you hear it's full of immigrants. But then if you look the picture from another side, let's say the income of everyone living there, you discover that the fact is that people are poor there mm -hmm. and they have low services and so on. So maybe the issue is more about those element and it's very convenient for uh, some politician uh, or uh, to to push for some you know some uh, harm of uh, mass destruction i would say okay so okay. that we could look somewhere else instead of the problem okay okay so thank you very much to all our speakers